I have possibly the largest title of any of the spe <laughs> speakers today. Hope I win a prize or something. I don't know. We'll, we'll see what happens from there. Um, oh, that's not working. Um, so I wanted to share with you a little bit about design systems. So it seems that we see multiple tutorials online. We see different brands coming out with their own systems. And over and over and over again, we kind of wonder, you know, what's after the actual system itself? You know, how do we actually implement it? How do we work with it? How does it move into code? You know, how does it move into the back end? How does an actual user interact with that system? And so that's what I want to show you. So this is more me showing you and kind of peeling back the curtain of how we did it at Amnesty. Some stuff was amazing and went really terrifically. Some stuff we had to really kind of learn on our own and you know, got thrown against the ropes, but we made it through. So I'm going to be showing you a lot of that um, as we go along. Um, so for me, I've been doing this for about 21 years now. You can see when you get closer to me, you'll see the gray hairs showing up on my beard now. Uh, and I've been doing, uh, teaching at different uh, schools around the tri-state area as well. Built over 50 websites in Drupal, built over 100 on WordPress. I don't show this to you all to impress you. I'm trying to show you that I'm still learning. I don't have the answers. I've been doing this for 21 years. So you never stop learning. You keep going. Uh, and that's exactly what we did with this. So it was me along with my whole team that were kind of learning how to go ahead and work the design system into what we wanted to do. Uh, and you'll see there, my last name is uh, Schutzmith. That's how you can find me on all the social medias, all the Twitters and such. Uh, so I came to Amnesty in May of 2016, uh, about two years ago next month. Uh, and when I told people where I was going, the first thing they kept kind of saying to me was this right here, that your site looks so 2019, that it looks like something that basically, or sorry, so 2009, looks like something basically that doesn't make sense anymore. It wasn't responsive. It wasn't able to do a very, very easy, simple user experience pieces. So when you look at this, we had a big problem as far as people viewing this on different devices. We had a big problem as far as people being able to know what they need to do. Uh, can anyone tell me what's the one thing I want you to do there first on that page? No, there's no way. <laughs> uh, so we have you know, a really big issue of a lot of cooks in the kitchen that we're trying to kind of invade and say what they thought should happen onto our website. Um, and the other big thing too is that you know, looking at it, we didn't know where to start on this. You know, do we start making it responsive? Do we start just trying to take away some of that yellow, <laughs> all the mustard that's there, we just weren't sure. So one of the first things I did is I started looking at other examples of other amnesties. So I'm in charge of Amnesty International USA. We're a very specific section here in the US. Um, so if you see anything here, like Muslim travel ban posters, things like that, that's us that does that here in the US. The way it works is that other amnesty sections around the world handle their own kind of marketing and branding and web design and things like that. This is the main amnesty.org. So this is like our parent organization that kind of oversees all of us. And they had just gone through a rebranding about uh, two years before I got on board. And so looking at this, I was immediately excited because I could really kind of understand you know, what you wanted me to do here. I knew kind of you know, what the user experience would be. When I was looking at it and trying to figure out you know, how they put everything together, I saw common frameworks they were using. I saw that they were using updated languages. So it all started kind of making more sense to me that we should look at what other Amnesty sections had done as well. This is Amnesty Australia. So they also did a very similar type of thing to the amnesty.org uh, one as well. But what you'll notice is that they're similar, but they're not the same. And that's what we wanted to convey too. We wanted to make it so that our site was kind of set up as like a sibling in a way, right? So it's not something that's gonna be a complete identical twin, but you know, if we were all in a family shot, we kind of look <laughs> like we belong together. And so that's what I wanted to set up as well. We had uh, about seven or eight different actual goals, but these were the top three that kind of kept coming up uh, for us. The first one was we wanted it to be responsive and mobile. We wanted to make sure that this looked good on all devices, no matter what. 
Um, if you use the Wayback Machine, you can go back to 2016 and see how it wasn't responsive. And what you'll notice is that you, know, you literally had to do the whole squinting to get in there to see what was on our pages. So making it responsive and look good on specific devices was really important to us. Uh, and one of the key things we did as well was in our Google Analytics, we looked to see what were the most used devices? What, was pe what were people coming to our site on most often? And what time of the day as well? Uh, we also looked at defining the ladder of engagement. That was a really important piece to us. Um, this was something that just hadn't really been done internally. The ladder of engagement to us is thinking about how does someone come into being involved with Amnesty? So they might first come in hearing about you know, uh, an, act, uh, an activity or a protest or something that we're doing uh, you know, uh, uh, in front of City Hall or in front of uh, the Capitol or something like that. Or they might see you know, a Twitter retweet or something like that, and that brings them in. What we wanted to be able to see was what brings them in, what keeps them going, what makes them fall off, too. So what don't they like and what, don't, what keeps them excited about what we have? And then the last piece was creating a visual language. So actually taking all of those pieces together and thinking, so how do we actually mimic this and keep redoing this? How do we use this as a microsite? How do we use this as other smaller types of applications, maybe desktop app, maybe mobile app, things like that? And these were right set from the beginning. We didn't kind of you know, theorize where we're going to go for these goals or not. These are main ones we had to hit no matter what. We also used uh, what's called a MOCA project management um, system. So Dan yesterday talked about RACI. Uh, we, had, we used to use RACI as well. But we used MOCA, which is a little bit different. So it looks like this. So you have a manager that's on the top that kind of oversees everyone that's going on uh, in the system. So for us, that was my de deputy executive director. Uh, you have an owner. Uh, that was me. So that's your project manager. That's your digital technology manager, someone like that. Uh, you have the uh, person, people that are consulted. So those are people that might be on the outside a little bit, but you need to get their input. You need to hear from them. You need to get their feedback. You need to know what they want, what they don't want, things like that. And so those are people like our member leaders, our me membership at large, the whole kind of, uh, we have hundreds of thousands of members in the US, so getting their input as well, which was interesting. Uh, other departments uh, also, and then also looking at um, all kinds of different folks that we just hadn't thought of before, that we didn't know were actually people who would want to come to this website or want to be able to kind of understand what we were working on. Uh, the next one was uh, the helper. So helpers are folks that are actually helping get the job done. These are the folks that you would imagine are probably on your team or probably on ancillary teams next to you that are all working together in parallel. So for us, that was our junior developer, our graphic designer, our vendors, all those types of people working together are the helpers. Um, they're carrying out the tasks. And then approvers. And approvers are the folks that you need to get your approval from. So in my case, it was people like the board, um, our executive director, again, my deputy executive director as well, who's, who I reported to. Uh, and then we added one more, and that was the I from RACI. And does anyone remember what the I was? All right, it's informed. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we were also informing people of what was going on. How was the website redesign going? How is this design system being put together? What was the progress that was happening? How well is it kind of playing out? What are the pitfalls, things like that, as we were doing it? So not later on. We were literally informing a lot of people publicly about what we were doing and how we were working at it. Uh, and for us, so we don't call it mocha. We call it mochai, <laughs> which is my favorite drink. It's lovely. It's terrific. Um, but internally, so if you talk to someone at Amnesty USA and you say, oh, yeah, you guys use mochai, they'll know exactly what you mean. So it's pretty cool. Um, so knowing all that, kind of having a foundation of what we were going to do, we had to figure out where, we were, where were we going to start? How are we actually going to kick this thing off and get moving? Um, and for me, there's two big things we had to figure out. One was the right design partner to use, because we didn't have designers internally. Uh, my background is more development, but I also taught myself web design and graphic design and things like that. But I knew that wasn't going to be me. I had time managing. I wanted to focus on the code side, things like that more often. 
So we found a great studio called HyperAct, uh, which is based out of Brooklyn. Um, they're very active in uh, the AIGA, a graphic design association here as well. Uh, and they're a social impact design firm. I mean, that's like, that's perfect. You know, we went together very well. Um, and what was very interesting about them too was their work was really amazing. Um, but the other big thing was they were founded by two refugees. So we had D-Roy on the left, who was from Cuba, and Julia, who was from the Ukraine, on the right. And they knew about, about the work that we did. They knew about the audiences we were going for. They had known the personal struggles and stories of the same stuff we're dealing with all the time. So it was a, a, a much different kind of uh, um, feeling and kind of you know, responsibility for them to do amazing work for this. So we had a really great time working together uh, throughout the project. And I'll show you a few examples of what they put together. So to start off, we wanted to figure out who our audience was. Um, we went through and did even more than this, but these are the top things. So the, we went to amnesty conferences. So we have a bunch of different conferences um, regionally around the US where we go and we have activists come together and students and different member leaders. So we went to these conferences and talked to them about you know, what was going on and getting their input as well. Uh, we had stakeholder workshops where we actually walked through, um, brought people into our offices over here on 34th Street and also in Washington, D.C., and actually walked through uh, some different types of design thinking um, programs with them to actually go through and model, you know, what are some of the ideas we can come up with and what are some of the things that you want to do uh, and want to have for this website. We also did a bunch of group interviews. We did an online survey, which I'm going to show you, uh, a member leader and volunteer calls, a lot of phone calls, one-on-one <laughs> -on -one interviews, um, analytics heat mapping, which you would, which you would uh, um, expect anyways. So our focus groups kind of looked like this. So this is one of our ones that we did in New York. Um, and we literally went through different scenarios of, you know, what's that supporter journey look like? What kind of actions do people want to take when they get to our website? What kind of information are they actually hitting? What kind of information are they not? And we made sure that our groups were made up of a diverse group of folks, um, not just in their backgrounds or things like that, but also, you know, what's their role in the organization? Or do they even have a role in the organization? Are they... Are there people who haven't heard of amnesty and don't know what the candle means and things like that? And so we wanted to really kind of keep that going. So we made multiple groups like this where we just kept getting feedback and getting other ideas from uh, right from the beginning. We did things like card sorting, word associations, a little bit of content exploration, things like that. Um, and a lot of these things came right all the way through to what we have today on our actual website, um, which makes me really, really happy. We also looked extensively through our Google Analytics as well. Um, we were averaging about one million a month uh, uniques, which is, which is pretty good for us. Um, I think we might have been beating out our parent organization even, so I don't know. <laughs> uh, but there's one number that kept popping out at me in this Google Analytics, and it just it triggers me every time I see it. <laughs> what number on there do you think looks really suspicious? Bounce, yes, the bounce rate. Our bounce rate was insane. 15% bounce rate, that's unheard of. So I've done websites for like Dave Matthews Band and they might be giants and folks like that. They're not even close to bounce rates like that. And they have music playing on their sites that people wanna have. So <laughs> we were trying to figure out what was that piece? What were those bounce rate thing? Come to find out it was actually a bunch of scrapers. So we used to have all this different content on the site and it would just keep getting scraped over and over and over again, especially from research organizations and things like that to see what's changed on our pages. So they would just sit on it all the time. Thousands of different machines. So that's, that's what it came to. We also did heat mapping as well. So that we put the heat mapping on the old website. Um, on heat mapping, for those of you who don't know, the red spots are really, uh, uh, really triggered, so those are the ones that people are clicking on a lot. The yellow spots also are ones that they're clicking on as well. Our biggest pieces that people are clicking on were our work, careers, um, and also uh, get involved as well. And so that informed some really good uh, information for us. We also did uh, uh, what's called a feedback um, form. 
So on these feedback forms, this is using Hotjar, and we love Hotjar, by the way. If you haven't used it, I definitely recommend trying it out and checking it out. So in Hotjar, we allow people to actually go ahead and tell us kind of what they think about the website. This is an example right there. So we have this little, <laughs> this little smiley face on the website. It's there right now, too, so you can put stuff up there and talk to me, and I'll look at it later. But we have this little smiley face. You can say whatever you want to. That goes to my whole team. And then we go through that every week, sometimes a few times a week, because we want to see what's going on if we're pushing something out and maybe something's, you know, broken or whatever, that's how we're finding out first. We're finding out quickly that way for people to actually give us information on that. <clears throat> uh, we also did an online survey. So in the online survey, you know, everyone likes to do online surveys and get feedback. And what we realized was we need to really reduce this to three basic questions. What do you like about the current site? What do you dislike about the current site? And what do you wish that we, you could do on a new site? That was it, that's all I wanted to know. And so a lot of the answers we got back actually got people to write paragraphs and paragraphs and paragraphs of text because we weren't just giving them yes, no questions and things like that, and we weren't giving them 20 different questions to fill out. We were focusing on really just three key things that we really wanted to know about inside of there. Um, and we said this to our entire email list too. So 1.3 million people got this <laughs> and just flooded that site to answer it, which was really great. Um, so doing all that discovery, we also wanted to go ahead and you know, figure out, so how is this design system going to work? And you know, why would we need a design system in the first place? Um, the research was showing us that we should do a design system. HyperAct was recommending that we should do a design system. My gut already, before I even started it, said we should probably do a design system because you know the web, everyone kept talking about design systems. Um, but my apprehension was why would we really need to do it? And for me, I always have to break things down into digestible pieces I can really understand. And so I had to break it down into a few different things. So these are the top three things for me was, it was supporting the brand. So it was actually making it look like we fit in with the other countries and what their branding is, but we're not the same. Again, it goes back to that whole concept of siblings. We're, we're sibling sites, that's what we are. Um, and it's also naturally agile. And I haven't heard a lot of people talk about this with design systems, but if you think about it, the design system gives you these building blocks, basically, that you can build upon quickly. You can mess around, you can mess things up, you can do all that literally in just a little matter of time and show it to someone. And so for us, that was really gonna be able to change the game for us, and it has, so that we can make page designs really quickly, show it to somebody, get feedback, and literally launch that page like probably the same day if we had to. So that's been a game changer. Um, and then the last piece is the ease of use. So being able to make sure that it's reinforcing a recognizable pattern for us to be able to use over and over and over again. Um, and that's been really key. And I'll show you, especially when we do the development part, um, sorry, the coding part, that'll make a lot of sense. For us, uh, you know, I was looking at a lot of design systems out there. Atomic design made the most sense, is the most common. Brad Frost is awesome. <laughs> so a lot of the things that we were looking at you know, we were trying to break it down and look at the pieces of the design system that we'd be interested in. For us, the, the actual nomenclature of atoms and molecules and organisms, that really didn't work well with our internal people, um, getting them to understand exactly what that was all about. So we broke it down to modules. That's what we said it was going to be. It was going to be modules, and that's how we would focus on it. We also knew that for us, we had Bootstrap 4. Um, for Bootstrap 4, we knew this was already a design system we could use. We knew it was one that was already a framework as well. So we wanted to actually go through with that. It's easily skinnable. I know there's some grumbling because it's Bootstrap, <laughs> but it made sense. It made for, sense for us to actually do that. And what we wanted to focus on was creating one system to kind of rule them all. So how could we actually do that? How could we actually make one system we could reuse over and over and over again for different microsites, applications, things like that. And for us, we had this great tool that no one ever seemed to know any of us had. So our parent organization had made a visual identity toolkit called the Big Yellow Book. And I already love it because it sounds like a hacker term. <laughs> So the big yellow book basically went through and told us a bunch of different kind of branding rules we should follow. Um, it was a guide, more than anything. Some things were very strict, like you can't mess around with the logo, 
people will get mad. <laughs> Some of the other things like are, are yellow. I now know exactly what yellow we are. <laughs> so if you give me three different things, I can point out the right yellow to you. Um, but other pieces, you know, how we would use it in different types of devices and things like that, we're all kind of open for a little bit of interpretation. Um, a lot of the colors they gave us, too, were a little bit washed out for our grays and things like that. So we shifted a little bit to make it more, make more sense. Um, and our typography and even our illustrations were all done in a specific style. So we knew that we could kind of still have this sibling look if we went ahead and kind of used this a little bit as our foundation. And so now when I show you <laughs> the Amnesty.org site or the Amnesty Australia site, you can start to see how that big yellow book had its influence on those designs. And so that's exactly where we went. So with HyperAct, we started at about the middle of that spectrum um, for atomic design. So we started about the middle point. We didn't go way back down into atoms, and we didn't go right up to making whole pages or things like that. We started about the middle way, because that's how a lot of our content was. That's the best way we could really think of it uh, and move forward with that. On HyperX end, I'm pretty sure they started with the atom level. They were very specific, looking at very small pieces. But for us, it was about the middle side. This is an example of uh, our work section. This is uh, what it looks on, a, on an issue page. So these are all just wireframes that we're kind of playing around with. Uh, we did a lot of this, just kind of seeing like what things would make sense, what things wouldn't, um, with real text, by the way, real content. Not lorem ipsum, not hipster ipsum, not bacon ipsum, real content. Um, because that's always been a thing with me too. I, I've worked with clients before I was at Amnesty, and whenever we're putting in fake content, the problem is, what does the client come back with? A lot more content than what we had designed for. Um, so what I wanted to make sure was that we were doing it the right way from the be beginning. Uh, this is an example of a feature, a header, also with our navigation as well. Uh, and then we had multiple different navigations they also looked at for us. So the next thing we did was taking these wireframes that made sense for us, uh, HyperAct then looked at how to apply the yellow book to these designs. How would it make sense? What would it look like? And so they started experimenting with that as well. So just doing little pieces of differentiation, font sizes. You'll notice we're actually using one font on the entire website. It's called Amnesty Trade Gothic. Eh, we're special. <laughs> um, but that font is used throughout over and over and over again. I only have to load that in. I don't have to load in a ton of different fonts as well moving forward. You can also see the other thing is that we don't have a lot of yellow. Yellow is used sparingly. And you'll notice that on our website now. Yellow is very, used very sparingly. Um, it's supposed to be like a dab of mustard. That's it. You know, we're not smothering it, putting it everywhere. It's just a dab of mustard there for our, for our uh, coloring. Uh, this is an example of the teaser. And on the teaser, that's the actual finished one. And so you start to see how we just kind of refined it and made it make a lot of sense. Um, one of the big pieces I want to stress on this, too, is that we focused on white space. We focused on making negative space on the actual design so people could focus their eyes more. Um, and you'll notice that a lot. And if you drill down into our website and get into specific content, you'll notice we have a lot of white space going on in between sections to really kind of push it out and make it show up uh, even better. And then this is the example of a header with a navigation. Um, and that's what it looks like. Uh, I think two weeks ago, that's what it looked like. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. Uh, so, you know, focusing on that, again, like we're trying to use yellow as sparingly as we can. For us right now, we're actually going to be changing that take action button um, to make that a different color so that we can focus more on that sign the pledge of support that you see there. So making it so that at least on the home page, people are focusing more on that piece right there. That's what some of our data has shown us to, to kind of do. So with all that, so as HyperAct was designing these pieces, they were giving it to us in Sketch. Um, and I love Sketch. I've always used Photoshop and Illustrator. I can do those really well, too, which is really, I know, a weird thing for a developer to say. But <laughs> I could be able to, to work my way around those. But for us, um, Sketch just, it's already built in that way, again, of, of you know, having these different types of symbols and things like that that can be reusable and move around. And so it just took a little bit of education on my side to teach our developers and other vendors how to work with Sketch because they weren't sure. Um, but that was it. Once everyone kind of understood you know, how these elements are in Sketch, we were off and running. 
so they broke it down by actually showing us different modules all the way through Sketch. So we had um, a ton of different artboards showing us every different type of content that we would need to have on the website, which was terrific. We haven't even used all of them yet. <laughs> we still have things that we might use in the future, which is, which is a really good thing to have as well. Uh, and then they also showed us what some mockups might look like. And I say might look like. These weren't, you know, this is what the website's gonna look like. These were, hey, your about page could look like this. Your, you know, making a difference page could look like that. And it was just to kind of give us a sense of what things could be if we went in that different direction. They also spelled out for us the uh, mobile navigation and the footer for the mobile. I show this because I feel like it's one thing we overlook a lot of times. It becomes an afterthought. Someone's like, oh, just throw in a hamburger menu. Like, no one thinks about how this is actually going to work and what it's going to look like and how people interact with it. So they actually spelled these things out for us. Um, it even showed us a little bit of animation on how, how things should interact. And then uh, the piece de resistance was showing us how the different fonts uh, and uh, buttons and also the coloring would all work together on the website as well. So with all that, at the same time, we were also figuring out our tech. So we weren't waiting for design to end. We were doing this at the same time in parallel. So our tech stack, we were looking at a bunch of different things. One of the things I kept thinking about was, why don't we just make this a static site? Like, why don't we just do static site generators? That could make a lot of sense. Um, we were coming from Drupal 6. Anyone still on Drupal 6? No? OK, good. <laughs> So with Drupal 6, it had all kinds of issues. Um, we, so we were looking at, you know, maybe we upgrade to Drupal 8, maybe we go with Middleman or Satamic or something like that. We ended up going with WordPress. Um, and there's some specific reasons for WordPress that made a lot of sense to us as well. Again, for me, I always got to deduce it down to what are, the, what are the main reasons. For us, it was the faith in maintenance that uh, a lot of times, you know, when you go to upgrade something and some of the other CMSs, you get a white screen of death, <laughs> and then you're kind of freaking out, and you know not to do it at 6 p.m. on a Friday. <laughs> so one of the things we loved about uh, WordPress was that no matter what, we had that faith in maintenance. That when we updated something, it worked. We didn't have big issues that were going on. Um, and we also work in a dev test live environment as well. So we were testing these things before they were going out. But you know, if the maintenance works better, it just gives us more time to do other stuff rather than having to figure out why something's not working, which should be when it's provided to you. Uh, easier development as well. So a lot of the people that we're working with already know PHP. A lot of the folks that we're working with already kind of understand some of the systems that they put in place for WordPress. So that made sense for us. And a robust community. Um, that was probably number one, because if we needed to bring in more people to work with us, if we wanted to share this with a new vendor, if we wanted to create some of our own plugins, which we are right now, we'd be able to find those people to work with. Um, and that would be excited to kind of do what we're doing. And because we're a nonprofit too, we want to be able to have the most possible people to work with. You know, I don't want to limit it just to you know, people in one specific location or something. I want to find people globally that I can actually bring in and help us. Uh, we also needed to figure out a starter theme. So we wanted to figure out what we were going to use to actually make uh, this work. So for us, it was Sage, which used to be called Roots. I don't know if any of you used that before. The big thing for us, again, it goes back to it's on Bootstrap 4. Um, it has great tooling. So we were using the version with Gulp and uh, Bower. What else? SAS. Um, now we're using the Webpack version, which is even more amazing. Uh, but you know, really, it came to us being able to make themes and work in a development environment that we enjoy. So that's why we went with that one. And then we needed to focus on really looking at how would we go ahead and kind of put all this together? How would we make the code? How would we actually start this and actually make it make a lot of sense? Um, the problem we had to figure out was how do we incorporate that system into the website? So we wanted to keep it simple and sassy. <laughs> um, so what Hyperact did is they went through all of the wireframes and broke it down for us and kind of what they were thinking would go in each different type of section and what these different modules looked like and how they could be combined. 
And I don't have a screenshot of that, but they did this over and over and over again. I have sketch files with like 20 artboards that show us all different kinds of combinations that will look great together. So we could see this before we even got to code. And I know a lot of people um, say, you know, get to code first and then you can move things around. But for us, this actually sped us up a lot because we didn't have to, we didn't have to waste time trying to see if certain things would work together or not we actually could see it right there really quickly to see, okay, a banner one looks great underneath the Navigation 1A. Uh, so we started with building it in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Um, this is just a quick run through of that. So we went through and literally just made a, uh, just a, like a pattern lab page for ourselves of all the different possible modules that we had put together. Um, we didn't do any type of craziness in this. We stuck to just basic HTML, basic CSS uh, and minimal JavaScript if possible. Animations and things like that, we stick to, to CSS. So that's how you know, we just tried to focus on making it the easiest possible for us to kind of put these things together. This was just for us as the developers internally. So this is something for us to be able to look at and to be able to grab code from while we started building it. The next thing we had to figure out was how do we actually integrate this into the website. So we have this HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. In the past, what would we do? We'd make all these different page templates in WordPress, and then we'd make users choose a page template, and we could have like 70 page templates at that point. No one outside of the development team is gonna know what page template to use. They're gonna have to do it, and then they're gonna have to put it in specific fields, and then the fields won't be what they wanted, and it's just a whole you know, cluster. So we started looking at different things to use. Visual Composer kind of made sense. Um, how many people have used Visual Composer before? Gotcha. <laughs> so Visual Composer um, is, I mean, it's a really quick, great tool to be able to put designs together. But for us, it gave the user a little bit too much control on what they wanted to be able to do. So I was on my commute, and I had a copy of Web Designer Magazine. <laughs> Um, this is the April 2017 issue, which I think I got in like February of 2017 or something. Uh, and I open it up and I'm looking at it and I came across this article. And this really changed the game. And it talked about creating custom page layouts in WordPress using advanced custom fields and what's called the flexible field and also a repeater field. Um, and laid it out really simply, just really quickly how to put it together. So we prototyped it literally that night I did a little prototype. The next day we went through it and actually did some tests and saw that everything worked beautifully and made a lot of sense. So for us, advanced custom fields uh, would allow us to be able to do some of these pieces. Um, so an advanced custom field, for those who don't know, basically gives you the ability to put these custom fields into WordPress that you then can put anywhere onto your edited pages, basically. So it gives users that usually wouldn't be able to know how to put like you know uh, uh, an image in there or uh, an embed for a video or maybe we're having them collect different data or something in the back end gives them capabilities that aren't normally there. The two big fields that we focused on were flexible content fields. That's the main thing that makes this layout work. Basically, it makes it so that you can move these fields around. You can be able to turn them on and off and things like that. And repeater fields as well. So we have things like repeatable cards that basically if we have you know, someone who's do, showing a bunch of images, we can actually repeat that over and over and over again so we don't have to make you know, field one, field two, field three. Um, so let's take a look at some of the code and examples. So this is an example of the about page. And this is the back end. So that same image you saw there, we allow people to go in, they can swap out an image if they want to. Uh, they can decide what the alignment's gonna be, they can change the title that goes next to it, the body, things like that. Um, some of the other things that you notice too is they can change what type of link it is too. And they can choose from an internal link that's on the website or an external link that's gonna be somewhere else. Uh, and that helps us with two things. One, it helps us with our analytics a little bit because we treat them differently. Um, and it also allows us to be able to make it easier for them to choose something. Uh, we also allow them to change the margins and the padding as well. Uh, we do put pixels on there. So we say, you know, a small is like eight pixels and things like that. But we're not worried about them knowing pixels. This is for people who might know it a little bit more than others. 
And this is another example. So this is how we add a new module. So these are all available modules right now. Uh, altogether, we have 26 uh, modules available. Um, this is showing how we would add an image in here. Uh, this is going to add in a chart. But we could add in things like buttons. We could add in headers. We could add all these tips, different types of pieces. And we're just giving users the capability to say, OK, I want a yellow primary button. Everyone knows what the primary button is for us. We just say it's the regular button. So that's the traditional amnesty yellow button. So they would know to choose that in here and actually put it up there. What you'll see is, and don't worry so much about the fields, but what we do is we try to make it as simple as possible so those users can come in here and not have to think about how to do these things, and instead focus on their content to make it come alive on there. Um, this is an example of us being able to, to kind of change the order of them as well. So as you move them around, they'll actually move around on the, on the actual page. So we're not stuck having you know, just our images after our content or whatever moving forward. We can actually just move it around to wherever we want to really quickly, save it, update it, boom, and everything's live and going well. <clears throat> and then this is the flexible content field. So everything's in one field. See that? One field in advanced custom fields. It's going to take a minute to open. There it goes. <laughs> And so inside of that field, we have all these other fields that we throw in there. Uh, some of them are repeater fields. That's the heading text field up there with all the different options underneath it with more fields. Uh, we have a body text one below that as well. So we also allow people to override the body text if they want to. Uh, and this just made it much easier for us to be able to also administrate this from a development standpoint. When we have to make a change, we just go into here and make it quickly and get out. Um, another thing that I'll, I should stress too is we have this running through Git. So all of this goes right into our Git commit. So we actually have it running through, uh, ACF can hook up to JSON. So that's how we have it actually going through there as well. And this is the code. Hopefully you can see it okay. But um, the big piece, so this is where we start these rows basically at the top there. Then we start actually bringing in the different uh, pieces for the loop. But the real bits and bobs where you put your contents right in here, where I have this echo, that's it. This is just looking at what module's loading. That's all. And so once it finds it, you put in your bit and your bob. <laughs> and we move forward from there. Um, so this changed a lot of stuff for us. This made it so that we really could think of the different types of modules we'd want to do in code, put them in there, not be worried where they were also in the order on the actual code as well. Uh, because again, they move around through the actual application. So it's just going to do an if statement to find that particular piece, show it when it needs to show it, and that's it. So the future for us is to basically take the same thing and put it to a few other systems. So we're doing a mobile application. We're actually almost in beta phase right now. So we'll be in beta in the next month, where we'll start getting people on board to actually test that. So if you're interested in testing it too, let me know, because I only have so many seats that we can use. Uh, and it's using the same system. So we're building on the Ionic framework, which is a hybrid. And it's using the same system inside of there. We're using some things from Bootstrap, but mostly it's the same system um, that we showed back with Sketch there. Uh, we're also doing a public-facing style guide, which is going to go live next month as well. Uh, and we're working on a desktop application for the fall. So in your system tray, you'll actually have a little notification that tells you when we need your help. So when we need you to sign a petition or we need you to go take an action, it'll actually give you a little, little light up there uh, as well using Electron. The other big thing we're working on is putting this into what's called Gutenberg. Gutenberg's kind of like the future of WordPress. It's making it more WYSIWYG, which I know we all love to hear. <laughs> so what we're doing right now is we're working with Automatic to basically make these pieces that we did with advanced custom fields, put them into blocks in Gutenberg so that it's a little bit more visual so people could see what's going on. Um, and the future of that to us is still kind of unknown. It was supposed to launch, Gutenberg was supposed to launch in April. I think it's now August or something. It's a ways away. So. So we're seeing where we can take it from there. And that's the whole system. That's how it's all put together. <laughs> Thank you.